guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we're going to take a look at this server right here, which is the Tyen Transport FT65TB8030. But if that feels like it's not specific enough, that's okay because there is a more specific model number for this server, which is actually the B8030 F65TV8E2H-2T-2. N. You have to love the engineering model names of these things. But the cool feature here is actually the fact that it is a single socket AMD Epic tower server that is designed to really house a whole bunch of GPUs. And so in this, we're just gonna kind of go over the system and we're gonna just kind of talk through the different components and some of the design decisions that Tyen actually made. Now we do wanna point out that we did have a review of this unit a little while ago. And what basically happened was Tyne was like, hey, do you wanna make a video of it too, now that you've done the review? And I was like, yeah, I guess that's, that's more content. So they let us keep this server, it'll go back after this, but we're gonna mark it as sponsored since they did send the server. So we're just gonna go do that, just so you know what's going on here. We will link the full main site article in the description of this video, so you can go check that out. But I figured what we do today is we would just kind of go through the server and go look at all the different components and all the kind of cool things in it. And so let's get to that and let's start with the outside of the system for our external hardware overview. Now, the front of the server actually has a bunch of storage and it also has, you know, the main LEDs, buttons and USB. And so let's kind of get into that real quick. Now at the top of the server, what you're gonna see is that we have both two USB type A or USB three type A ports, as well as your status LEDs and power buttons and all that kind of stuff. Something that is a little bit fun in the server, just because we don't see that many servers with these anymore, is that we actually do have an optical disk drive bay. The other thing you're gonna see is that we actually have a little drive, what looks like basically an eight bay, uh, two and a half inch drive bay system that doesn't have the back plane, it's not connected with cables, and you know, it's, there's a blank in front of it, but it looks like maybe that there was a spot that if they wanted to have a different model, maybe with eight more drives, you might be able to do that here, but our model does not have that feature, it just kind of looks like it's the space for it. However, below that, we actually have two two and a half inch drive bays, which is absolutely awesome. These two drive bays can be either SATA or they could be NVMe as kind of like the base in the system, but you could also potentially go and put like a SAS controller in there if you really wanted to go run these things on SAS and maybe have like a RAID controller or something like that. But most likely I think that folks are either gonna use this as two and a half inch U.2 NVMe storage, or they're gonna go use it as SATA storage, right? Something that is cool is also just the fact that you do get toolless hot swap carriers in these, so that is nice. And that also is a feature that will translate to the next set of drives. And that really kind of gets you to the next set of drives, which you get a total of eight three and a half inch drive bays. Now these eight three and a half inch drive bays are actually SATA based. You could have a SAS controller and do RAID in them, of course, if you wanted to, but I think a lot of people are just going to use SATA with this. These drive trays also are toolless, which makes them easy to go and swap in and out drives. So you can kind of see that here. So overall, we get a total of two, two and a half inch drives, and we could put NVMe in there if we want. And then we also get eight three and a half inch drives on the front of the chassis. That's basically what we have here. Now let's get to the rear of the chassis to keep checking the system out. Okay, now on the rear of the chassis, we have a bunch of different features and we're gonna talk about a couple of them. Uh, you know, the first big one is really this power supply. Now this is a two kilowatt power supply. It's made by FSP and it has this just giant power switch on the back of it. It was actually extraordinarily gratifying to go and flip the switch. I don't know why it just was a large switch to go hit. And also just a note on this power supply is the fact that it is a two kilowatt power supply. You know, if you're at a kind of like 200 plus voltage, but if you're down, uh, you know, say you have like 120 or something like that, it'll be a 1.5 kilowatt power supply. And if you're down in the like, you know, 100, 110 ish range, 115 range, you're going to see this more as a 1.2 kilowatt power supply. And so that's just something to keep in mind. And it is important because if you do load this up with a bunch of accelerators, well, then you're probably going to need to go and figure out some kind of solution for powering. If, uh, you know, you have like a bunch of very high power accelerators and CPUs and all that kind of stuff, the 1.2 kilowatts is probably not gonna be enough. So you probably won't wanna run a system like this, especially if it's fully loaded with accelerators on a you know higher voltage and I guess bigger circuit. And while we're at it, one other kind of interesting note just about this particular power supply is that in some ways it's a little different than a lot of the server power supplies that we see. Now, first off, it's not a redundant unit, it's a single power unit. And the other thing that is kind of interesting is just the fact that there are, I guess, a bunch of customizable cables in the back. And so you tend to see most of the power supplies, or at least the power supplies we see these days have kind of fixed cables instead of these that you can customize. And so it's just kind of something that 
feels a little bit more like something that you might see like in a high end workstation or something like that versus a server. And it's just kind of cool because it actually does get rid of a lot of the cable clutter with this. All the cables that we don't have in here are actually in the box right now. So we're not showing them, but that just kind of gives you some idea. Other big features on the rear of the system is that we're going to see that we have a out of band management port and two USB 3 ports. We're also going to have a VGA port, a serial console port, and that's basically all of your standard kind of IO. We're also going to have two one gigabit ethernet ports, which I guess is just kind of normal that you would have something like that. But you can see that we actually have a total of four ethernet ports. And we also have two 10G based T ports, which are based on an Intel X550 AT2 chip. So the server has both 10G based T as well as one gigabit ethernet options already built in. Something that is a little bit different about this solution versus some of the kind of like high-end workstations that you see with 10G based T is that this is a, you know, X550. So that is kind of one of Intel's, I guess, higher end data center. So it is a true server 10G based T adapter. Whereas sometimes you see some vendors that are putting things on like more like workstation-y or consumer-ish type uh, 10G based T solutions are not necessarily based on like, you know, something that's this high end. And that does have some impact in terms of overall server OS compatibility and supportability. So it is a much better solution that Tyne has here. Now, another feature that you're gonna see is that we have two expansion slots that are kind of sitting above the rear IO. And that was actually really interesting when we opened up the system. Now you're gonna see that for the most part, I'm gonna have this portion of the system taken apart, but I just kind of want to show you what's going on here. Now you back, you know, you have the rear expansion slots, but then you actually have the PCIe riser that comes up and you know is actually able to service this. So it was actually a way for time to go and put more PCIe lanes, and make more PCIe lanes exposed in this tower form factor than if they just had kind of normal PCIe expansion slots below. They have plenty of those. You can see them, we're gonna get to them in a sec, but just kind of a cool little feature that we have and I just wanted to show to you here. The other big feature on the rear of the system is that you can tell this is actually set up for GPU. So we have two large fan modules that are actually at the back of this chassis that cover up the GPUs. And you might say, well, why would I want two big fans on the back? I can't get to my you know, display ports or whatever it is, but this is really designed for compute accelerators, right? So these could be something like the NVIDIA A100, and they could also be something like FPGAs or what, what have you. And so you don't necessarily have a need for those kind of display ports on those kind of accelerators. Instead, what you actually need is more airflow because you have passive heat sinks, and that's really what these provide. Of course, these fans are removable if you wanna go do that. But since when we tested the system originally for the original main site article, we did actually have the NVIDIA A100s in here. So we did leave these fans to be able to cool those because they're extraordinarily expensive and I didn't want them to break. Okay, so let's get into the system and just kind of talk through a couple of the cool things that we have here. Now, we've already kind of talked about the storage and you can see we have the storage backplanes here. The next feature though is really the fans. This system, even though it's a giant system, has three fans in its primary partition, which is actually kind of cool. I mean, a lot of 4U servers that we get, we see a lot, you know, just tons of fans. And these are definitely, you know, not in the tons of fans category. It's not like six fans or something like that. It's only three. And while these fans are not on hot swap carriers, what you can see is that Titan actually did something here that's really interesting. They put a total of four rubber grommets on all of these fans, and then they basically have a little mounting system. So that way these fans can mount in the chassis, have some vibration, I guess, isolation, but then also be fairly easy to swap out if you needed to. You're probably still gonna take the system down to do it. They're not really hot swappable, and you probably would get some weird thermals if one of them failed. But at the same time, you definitely could do this fairly quickly if that was a service item that you needed to do. Still, fans these days are super reliable, so you're probably never gonna run into that issue. Now, the major feature, of course, of the system is the motherboard. And this motherboard is actually a Tyen S8030 motherboard, which you might remember from the long model name. And what you're actually gonna see on this motherboard, which is really important for servers these days, is the fact that this is kind of more of like an atx -y style motherboard rather than what we're seeing on a lot of the higher end servers from tie-in and other vendors. On some of the high-end servers, especially when you have a dual socket server, what you see is a proprietary motherboard form factor. And the reason for that is just the fact that these CPUs and memory slots that they can have, I mean, they just take up so much space that you basically need the entire width of a 19 inch chassis to be able to go and put all of those DIMMs and CPUs and all that kind of stuff just all the way across. But while those proprietary motherboards may work in the kind of like really high volume, data center server market, they're not necessarily tailored to things like pedestal servers that might be a little bit lower volume 
and you may want to customize a little bit more. And so that's kind of why this is actually interesting that it is taking something that is a more kind of like, we call them like channel focused motherboard, but just kind of a more standard form factor motherboard. The big feature of course, is the fact that we have a single AMD Epic CPU. Now this is a PCIe Gen 4 platform. So you're most likely going to have either a Epic 7003 Milan series CPU or an Epic 7002 series Rome CPU. It kind of depends on, you know, what kind of core count you can get and also just frankly, what kind of chip you can get. Let's, let's call the chip shortage what it is these days. But there are market segments that AMD is actually still using the Epic 7002 series, especially at the low end to go in service. And so that's just something to keep in mind when you look at the server that those are probably the two options that you would look at here. Now, the CPU actually has a total of eight DDR4 DIMM slots. Now you can use DDR4 3200, you can use RDIMMs, and you can you know use up to like 256 gig DIMMs in here, which gives you a total of two terabytes of memory capacity. I don't necessarily know if everybody's gonna use that capacity, but it is nice to know that you could do it. Now, one of the really cool things Things that you actually get in a system like this is just the fact that with the AMD Epic 7002 or Epic 7003 series, you actually get a total of 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes with a single CPU. And well, Pine is definitely taking advantage of that here because what you can see is that we have an absolute ton of slots in the system. Not only do we have that slot that was on that riser that we just showed a little while ago, but we also have this kind of main block of PCIe slots. You're gonna see five PCIe slots here, but we basically used four of them. Uh, and the reason for that is that we just that we use the double width NVIDIA A100. So when we use this system and we do the testing for the main site. And so the, I guess, you know, big thing here is that although you do have five slots, you're gonna see that most of them are double width spaced. And the reason for that is just because they're kind of assuming that if you're gonna buy a server like this, you're most likely gonna have a double width GPU or accelerator. One just little tiny feature that is kind of fun, I guess, is just that the IO expansion slot covers that are in this system, well, they're a little bit different than the normal plain flat ones that we normally see. Number one, they're totally solid, so they're not vented at all. And it's really to make sure that you're getting the airflow through any of the accelerators, especially if you don't have a full set. But the other kind of fun thing is the fact, well, these things actually have the mounting holes. So if you wanted to go and I don't know, have like a SAS controller or something like that, you'd have the mounting point to actually go do that using these. And it's just kind of something that you, know, you look at and you're like, oh, that's a little bit different, but it's kind of fun. Now between two of these sets of PCIe slots or PCIe by 16 slots, you're gonna see that we also get two M.2 slots. So if you wanna go put some storage in there, like let's say you wanna use that for boot devices, I guess you could do that as well. And just gonna say that that's another option that you have, although you, know, you have the two and a half inch base. Now what you're gonna see on the leading edge of this motherboard is the fact that we get a ton of cables. And well, there's a pretty good reason for that. The first thing is that, you know, we need connectivity. And like, let's take the front, for example, we need connectivity, for example, for the eight, three and a half inch bays. We also need to have two SATA connections. So those are actually seven pin SATA connections for the two and a half inch bays. But then we also need NVMe connectivity. So we need eight lanes of PCIe to be able to go to the front for that. We also need another set of lanes to go to the PCIe riser. And so, you know, that's really coming off the front of the system. And something that is nice that Tyne did is that they made these connectors mostly horizontal to the motherboard plane. The only difference really is the seven pin SATA connectors, but the rest of them are all kind of horizontal, which means that if you do have big GPUs, they're not really obstructing the airflow. And that was just kind of a cool little thing that Tyne did in the system. Another thing that is just kind of fun here is that we are gonna see a power connector, sorry, the ATX power connector, and that is horizontal. And we have another power connector that also is horizontal as well. So the power being horizontal also means that we get to improve our airflow from our three mid chassis fans. And that's just kind of something, again, that Tyne is keeping that design language all the way through this motherboard. Okay, so let's get to management. This system uses the A-Speed AST2500 baseboard management controller, and Tyne has its version of Megarack SPX that it puts on this server. And so, you know, you have your web interface, you have some Redfish capabilities, and then also things like, you know, if you just a really common feature that a lot of people use is the fact that if you want like an HTML5 IKVM solution, you have that here with remote media. The other nice thing though, is just the fact that on these Tyne servers, you can actually get that feature, but you don't necessarily need to pay an extra license cost like you do if you have like something like a Dell iDRAC or an HP ILO, something like that, you usually have to go pay for that IKVM functionality, but you don't necessarily need to do that here. The other thing you can do is that you can do all of your firmware updates, whether that's BIOS or the BMC firmware directly from the interface. 
and the web interface, you don't necessarily need to go and you know pay another license fee for that. That's something that Supermicro actually makes you pay, I think like 20 bucks or something like that for that, but you don't have to do it with this system. And that's kind of just a nice little, it's not huge, but it is a little cost saving, I guess. Now getting to performance, on the CPU side, we actually have something that's kind of interesting. We actually do have an active cooler. A lot of the servers that we see these days use passive heat sinks, but this because of the large fans and the fact that you don't have a just giant air duct running through this thing means that you do need a fan on the heat sink for the CPU. And so, you know, overall performance of the CPU was about what we would expect, just kind of seems like other systems. So I think, I think you know, we validated that performance. The other performance we wanted to validate was really the NVIDIA A100s in the system. And we definitely saw that when we ran them as independent units they certainly you know, looked about like what we've seen in other you know, rack mount servers. So this seems to be providing adequate cooling for the NVIDIA A100s. We only had 40 gig models to test. We didn't have the 80 gig models, but that's you know, some limitation that we just have. One other nice thing about the system is that you can use things like bridges between the PCIe cards. So something, even though we do have PCIe Gen 4 here, you don't necessarily get the maximum card to card bandwidth just using PCIe Gen 4 and going all the way through the Epic CPU to go from GPU to GPU or accelerator to accelerator. Now, what is nice is because of this is double width spacing on the PCIe slots between the four, you can actually go and put GPUs, say here with things like the NVLink bridges. Also the AMD MI100s, now they may have a new solution at some point in the future, but you know, with the MI100s, you do actually have a bridge that can go kind of bridge it among four GPUs. And that was something that, you know, you might see in a system like this. And it's just kind of made for that. It is nice that they're all in one plane. Something that when you see two use servers that have four GPUs, sometimes you can get, you know, a bridge that goes between the two GPUs uh, on either side, but you don't necessarily get to be able to go and connect all four. And so this can actually do that, which is kind of an interesting functionality really. So in terms of noise, uh, this server is definitely not, not quiet uh, by any means, especially, you know, in this configuration that we have. And really it's just because we have the GPU fans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it is something that when we did spin it up, it was, it was quite loud. Uh, certainly not something that you want next to your desk. Now, these days, when we test servers, we typically are testing rack mount servers. I mean, it's just the majority of the market at this point, definitely rack mount servers, no question about that. But this type of pedestal server, I actually think is really interesting. And the reason for that is that you can kind of see what this use case could be uh, really easily without really that much imagination. I mean, you have enough drive capacity here for definitely some local video storage. So if you had video cameras, say you had a warehouse or a factory or something like that, and you're taking all that video data, you're bringing it into the server, you have a array of hard drive storage, you also have some cache, they can do, you have some boot drives. And so, you know, you have this whole, I guess, setup to be able to go and ingest video using the AMD Epic processor to really kind of help that ingestion process. The other thing though that you have is that you also have the GPUs and you can use those GPUs. We had, you know, the A100s, but you can definitely use those GPUs for doing different types of inferencing tasks. And even those NVIDIA A100s, you can use MIG, which is many instance GPU and split them up into say seven GPUs. And NVIDIA has other cards that you could use as well. But the whole idea is is that you could go run a variety of inferencing workloads on the video feeds or the sensor feeds that you're bringing into the server at the edge. And you could just put this because it's a pedestal server basically anywhere. You don't need an entire rack to go and house this thing. So in terms of like, you know, could I imagine a use case or why would someone want to use a pedestal server like this? I think it actually makes a lot of sense. And so overall, I hope you enjoyed this look at the server we affectionately call the Tyan Transport HX FT 65 tb 8030. It's a cool pedestal server that can take a whole bunch of accelerators. And I think, well, that really makes sense. It's powered by AMD Epic and there's a lot of cool features in it. So I hope you enjoyed this video review. If you did enjoy this, well, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.